Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this series may contain images, voices or names of deceased persons. Welcome to Susan Carland In Conversation. This interview is a supplement to Episode 5 in the Australian Journey series, Multicultural Mosaic. very interesting being back here. I started Law at Monash in 1967 and for the first year or two years our lectures were in the engineering faculty and I'm sure this is one of the rooms. At least they all look like this. Um, now I should say the start of my involvement in refugee issues was the Tampa episode which happened when you guys were all at primary school I guess. <coughs> um, the Tampa was a Norwegian cargo ship. It was asked by Australia to go to the aid of some asylum seekers whose boat was foundering in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Palapa, which was the boat they were on, had begun to fall apart and the Tampa rescued them at Australia's request on the 26th of August 2001. Now the captain of the Tampa thought that there might have been maybe 50 people on the Palapa uh, and we knew that they were mostly Hazaras fleeing Afghanistan, which means that they were like about 99% certain to be fair income refugees. Um, but the captain of the Tampa was astonished when 438 people climbed out of the wreckage of the Palapa. And they're all herded together on the steel decks of the Tampa. And the captain of the Tampa headed towards Christmas Island, which was the nearest landfall on his... Uh, on his voyage. But John Howard um, d denied him permission to enter Australian territorial waters off Christmas Island. And there was a quandary for the captain of the Tampa because his ship was licensed to carry 50 people, he had 47 crew, and all of a sudden 438 unexpected passengers. And they're sitting on the steel decks of the ship in various states of health. There were pregnant women, there were people who were unconscious, there were people of various ages. It was a very difficult situation for him. So, in the finest traditions of, of seafaring, he entered Australian waters and Australian history um, in defiance of the Australian government. John Howard's response, and, and his response was specifically political in order to draw people back from one nation who drifted across to one nation, and um, he, what he did was to close uh, the airspace over Christmas Island so that aeroplanes couldn't fly in and get good photographs of the people who'd been rescued. He sent out the SAS who took command of the bridge of the Tampa at gunpoint. And so the Tampa was stalled in Australian territorial waters but not able to go forward and reluctant to go back because he's got hundreds of people more than his licence permits. Um, a group of us went to the federal court seeking orders no more adventurous than this, that the people should be put ashore on Christmas Island and placed in detention, which was the consequence of Australia's mandatory detention rules. Um, the, we went to court on the Friday afternoon and the government came along and said, we want the trial to start right now. So the case ran Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the judge reserved his decision. He handed down his decision at 2.15 in the afternoon, Melbourne time, on the 11th of September 2001. Eight hours later, the attack on America happened, and all of a sudden, the world seemed different. 
I don't think it was different, but it seemed different. Because all of a sudden, at least according to the Western press, you no longer had terrorists, you only had Muslim terrorists. You no longer had boat people, you only had Muslim boat people. And all of a sudden, John Howard started calling boat people illegal, which was something that caught on pretty readily. It's, you had to be there to understand what the climate was like after September 11. It was really, really extraordinary. Uh, in any event, that was the... That was the start of some of the worst things that have disfigured Australian history. And I should add, and I do this partly opportunistically, um, it was the start of increasing Islamophobia in this country, something which has helped the political push to exploit boat people as a whipping boy, um, but it has also disfigured our community in many other ways. And I don't know how many of you read Helen Razor. She writes for the Daily Review and various other, the Seto paper, I think, various other organs of the press. Helen Razor wrote something um, about six or eight weeks ago, which was so good that when I'd finished reading it, I wish I'd written it myself. And here it is. This is an apology. In a post earlier today, linked to an article written by me, I incorrectly identified those of you who disdain Islam as racist. I'm sorry about this. As you so deftly and cleverly remind me, Islam is not a race. You are therefore not a racist. I didn't mean to call you a racist. I meant to call you, how can I put this, history's worst reflex. I meant to call you the frail and fearful idiot who learned nothing of the lessons of 1933. I meant to call you the descendant of Nazism. I meant much more kindly to say that your belief that a little cultural difference is responsible for all the shit in your life is a product of an uninformed mind and an ugly spirit. I meant to say that I recognise those of you suddenly saying, well, what about the way they treat gays? As the same scum who used to beat me up at high school for being a, what was it you called me? an ugly dyke, not worth raping. I meant to say that you should remember Dachau, Belsen and all the other places in which human lives were sacrificed on the altar built on the foundation of your puny, disgusting hate. I meant to say that I know your stench. It has offended my nostrils for a lifetime. I meant to say that if you think Islam is intrinsically evil and you've somehow missed that the real evil in the world is belched from its financial centres, well, fuck you very much and you just keep on agreeing with brave intellectuals like Sonia Kruger and Andrew Bolt. <laughs> I meant to say that you do not need to love people. You don't even need to approve. You just need to fucking accept difference as an inevitable fact of life. But you never will, because you are made by offcuts of history's worst mistakes. I meant to say that you have nothing to say to me that I cannot read in the nation's worst newspapers. I meant to say you are a receptacle for the ideological shit of powerful others. I meant to say you sicken me. But I didn't mean to call you a racist. <laughs> Um, that actually is, it could almost be an anthem for our time because, uh, as I said, I think Islamophobia has not only fueled the anti-boat people position in Australia, it has genuinely disfigured Australian culture in ways that are incalculable at the moment. Anyway, back to refugees. There are three streams of refugees who come into Australia. First... There are those who come in as part of our offshore resettlement program. The offshore resettlement program is a program by which we go to uh, refugee camps in other countries and we handpick refugees and we bring them to Australia and we make them welcome and we look after them and it's an admirable program and we ought to be very proud of it. The second stream are those people who come to Australia by aeroplane um, and they come in on visas, typically short-term visas, um, characteristically, student visas, tourist visas, business visas, and the like. And once they have cleared passport control, they apply for protection. And when their initial visa runs out, they get a bridging visa, so they remain in the community for as long as it takes to sort out their refugee status. Um, interestingly, most members of the community are completely unaware of the existence of that group, um, and also unaware of the fact that around about 30 or 40% of them turn out ultimately to be assessed as refugees. The third group, the boat people, as compared to the aeroplane people, the boat people are people who cannot get a visa to come to Australia. 
because they come from countries where it is highly likely that they are in fact refugees and it is possible that they will apply for refugee status and so Australia will not give them a visa. Um, some of them can't even get travel documents from their country of origin. Uh, oddly, countries that are persecuting a particular group tend not to make life easy for them and letting them have passports, for example, would be making life a little bit easier for them. That group have no choice uh, if they're heading in this direction, they have no choice but to use people smugglers. Now, those of you who've travelled into Australia from other countries, whether you're an Australian citizen or not, you will notice that the uh, airline personnel check your papers very carefully when you're getting on the plane. The reason for that is that Australia says to the airlines, if you bring anyone to, into Australia who is not entitled to enter Australia, you can take them back to where you boarded them at your own cost. That's why the airlines are now a sort of de facto extension of the immigration department. They are doing the testing and that means that if you don't have a passport and if you don't have an Australian visa, you will not be able to get onto a plane. Um, getting onto a plane to come to Australia is far more desirable because it's less expensive and it is a lot safer. So if you can't do that, then you're forced to use people smugglers. And um, the people smugglers trade, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, is, it's important to recognise it is wholly demand driven. Now let me, let me just ask you all a question. This is not an exam question and you won't get any marks for it, but think about this. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a Rohingya from Myanmar or you're a Hazara from Afghanistan. Your people have been persecuted for more than a century. Um, the people who oppose you are dedicated to killing you all. And let's suppose that having seen relatives picked off in the street by snipers, let's suppose, that, let's suppose you're a Hazar from Afghanistan and you've seen children whose legs have been blown off because they've been used as minesweepers by the Taliban after the American invasion. Um, let's suppose you've seen your friends dragged off the bus and beheaded beside the road. Let's suppose you've fled with a number of your Hazara uh, friends to Quetta in Pakistan, and you've seen them picked off in the street by Taliban snipers. And let's suppose you decide it's all too dangerous, so you will head south and look for a place that will give you safety. So you head south and you pass across or through India, Malaysia, you end up in Indonesia. None of those countries have signed the Refugees Convention. None of them offer you protection. But at Indonesia, you hit the barrier. At Indonesia, you hit the water, and unless you're a really good swimmer, in which case Australia would probably welcome you, um, you can't go anywhere. You can go to Jakarta, to the UNHCR office in Jakarta. You can ask for a certificate saying that you're a refugee. And if you're a Hazar from Afghanistan or a uh, Rohingya in Burmese, it is overwhelmingly likely that they will give you a certificate saying you're a refugee. But the one month visa you get on arrival in Indonesia, when it runs out, you're at risk because if the authorities find you, they'll jail you. If you've got children, you can't send them to school because if you send them to school, you'll be found, you'll be thrown in jail. If you get a job, you'll be found, you'll be thrown in jail. So you can hide in the shadows until some country offers you protection or you can use a people smuggler. How long will it take to be offered protection? Well, on present indication, between 20 and 30 years. So, how many people in this room will wait in the shadows for 20 or 30 years? How many would not get on a boat? How many people would not use a people smuggler? None of you. I've never met any Australian who wouldn't use a people smuggler, and yet, and yet, we vilify the people who get here by using people smugglers. It's a very strange thing. Our mistreatment of boat people in the last 15 years has been quite astonishing. Um, the, I want to give you a few illustrations of it. The one that I still find difficult to talk about is the case that first locked me in on this subject. Um, it, it's an Iranian family, mum and dad and two daughters. They're not Muslim, by the way. They're from a 
a small pre-Christian group who are regarded in uh, Iran as unclean and who suffer the consequences of that assessment. They had lived in, or well, their family had lived in, that, in Iran for um, s over 100 years and they had put up with the persecution that comes with being a member of a, an unclean group. But after a particularly terrible incident involving the 11-year-old daughter, they decided to flee. And they fled to the southeast. They get to Indonesia. They get on a boat. They land in Australia. They're banged up in the Woomera Detention Centre in the South Australian desert. So it's mum and dad and two daughters, aged 11 and 7. After 15 or 18 months in Woomera, they're all doing it pretty tough, which is really characteristic of people in detention centres in the Australian system. But the 11-year-old girl in particular was in a very bad way. Um, really, I mean, she had stopped caring for herself. She'd stopped eating, she'd stopped grooming herself. She was frightened to go to the toilet block, which was 100 metres from their cabin. And so she'd wet herself during the day, she'd wet the bed at night. And Anyway, a psychiatrist in Adelaide heard about this went to Woomera, which is a three or four hours drive out of Adelaide, and he delivered a devastating psych report to the department saying that this child had completely given up, she was at extreme risk, she needed daily psychiatric help. Now in Woomera back then and subsequently in, in um, Baxter, if you needed urgent psychiatric help, you would get to see the visiting psychiatrist roughly once every six months. But this child needed daily psychiatric help. And so the psychiatrist urged that the department move the family to a metropolitan detention centre where the kid could get the daily psychiatric help she needed. So the family was moved to Maribyrnong Detention Centre in the western suburbs here. And although the reason for moving them was that the 11-year-old needed daily psychiatric help, for the first few weeks of their stay in Maribyrnong, nobody came to see her. Not a psychiatrist, not a doctor, not a nurse, not a social worker, no one. And on a Sunday night in May of 2002, while her mother and father and her young sister were off having their dinner in the mess hall, this little girl took a bed sheet and hanged herself. But she didn't know how to tie the knot properly. And so she was still strangling when the family came back to their room. They took her down, she and her mother were taken to the general hospital nearby with two guards, two ACM guards, so that as a matter of legal analysis, they were still in immigration detention. Um, Con Karapanagiotidis from the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre, which had only recently set up, um, he'd been looking after their visa claim and he heard about this. And he went to the hospital at about half past nine that night said good day to the guards, said he just wanted to speak to the mother to see if there was anything he could do. And the guards said to him, no, you're not allowed to see them because lawyers visiting hours in immigration detention are nine to five. And they sent him away. He then rang me at home at about 10 o'clock that night. And I still, 15 years later, I can still hardly believe that a country could be so indifferent to the suffering of an 11 year old child that they would drive her to try and kill herself and then turn away someone who was simply trying to help. Now, she spent 12 months in the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit at the Austin Hospital until she was assessed as well enough to be put back in detention. And they put her back in detention. We subsequently got them uh, protection visas. But nothing can excuse that kind of mistreatment. Mistreatment which has continued in case after case after case, I've seen the same sort of willful indifference that you would think is completely incompatible with the way Australia sees itself as a country. So for example, take the case of Abdul Hamidi. Hamidi had been, uh, he had fled Iraq, the Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and he uh, got to Australia using a people smuggler. He was, the, the notes of the immigration department show that within a couple of weeks of his arrival, they had assessed him as someone who had suffered torture uh, in Abu Ghraib prison uh, in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And they noted that the form of torture that most terrified him was being locked in a small room because in Abu Ghraib he'd been locked in a small cell and randomly electrocuted through water on the floor. So a small room was his, his room 101. 
Now, after about 18 months, he fell into hopelessness and despair and began self-harming. And his form of self-harm was to cut himself. So if he could find a bit of glass, he'd break it and cut himself. If he could find a bit of razor wire, he'd cut himself. And whenever he cut himself, the department would give him treatment of two sorts. First, Panadol, which is the universal cure in immigration detention. Second, solitary confinement in a small cell, which didn't help. When he got out, he was worse. He'd cut himself again. More Panadol, more solitary in a small cell. And this went on for five years until eventually a court ordered that the department have him assessed and if necessary, treated uh, at the mental health facility at Glenside in Adelaide. On his admission to Glenside, he was assessed physically and mentally. The mental assessment said that although he was only, I think, 31, 32 at the time, he would never be capable of holding down a job. He was so damaged mentally. On physical assessment, they reported that he had 10 metres of scarring on his body from his self-harming in immigration detention. That's what Australia's or immigration authorities thought deserved only Panadol and solitary confinement. And if I can give you a third example, the case of Amin Mustapur. Amin fled Iran with his eight-year-old daughter. They were locked up in Baxter, the new family-friendly detention centre at Baxter. I don't know how many of you remember uh, Philip Ruddock at the time declared that, that um, Baxter was the family-friendly detention centre, which actually led to a funny incident because um, shortly before Baxter was to open, I was asked to give uh, or take part in a panel session in South Australia to do with refugees. And shortly before I went over there, uh, a ground plan of the yet-to-be-opened Baxter Detention Centre fell off the back of a truck and drifted elegantly onto my desk. And so one of the other people on the panel was Philippa Godwin, who was then the Deputy Secretary of the Department in the um, Lock em Up Division. And, um, and I took the opportunity to ask her why it was that the electric fence which surrounds the Baxter facility was described on the ground plan as a courtesy fence. I didn't think it was courteous to electrocute people, not whether they're leaving or coming. And she looked at me coolly and said, it's not an electric fence, it's an energised fence. 5,000 volt energised fence. Made all the difference for her. I frankly don't think it would have made any. Anyway, Amin and his daughter are locked up in Baxter, the family friendly detention centre at Baxter, which is just a high security jail. Um, one day they're in their room and five guards came in and ordered Amin to strip. He refused, not only because of the cultural difficulty associated with it, but because his eight year old daughter was in the room. And so he refused and they roughed him up and handcuffed him and dragged him off to the management unit. And the only bit of video footage that survived to the trial of the case was video footage from the area outside their room. And you see five guards dragging him in across the lawn. And this little girl, eight years old, jumping on the back of the one, of the one of the guards, trying to stop him from taking away her father. Anyway, he was put in solitary in a, a cell which I've seen, two and a half metres square, bare concrete, nothing else in the room except a mattress on the floor. Um, for the first couple of weeks of a person's stay in solitary, they're not allowed anything to read, anything to write with, they're not allowed TV, radio, CD player, nothing at all. No distraction and no company and no privacy either because they are videotaped 24 hours a day and in order to enable the videotaping, the lights are left on 24 hours a day. I mean, the only break in each solitary 24 hours was a 20 minute visit once every 24 hours from his daughter. After he'd been in it for about two weeks, his daughter didn't come for her visit. And I mean, complained to the person, the department employee who ran the centre, the head of the centre explained to him that the daughter had been taken into Port Augusta shopping and that she'd be there the next day. The next day came and went, she didn't come for her visit. The same official who had given that explanation the day before came into his cell and said to Amin, your daughter is now back in Tehran. 
If you want to see her again, you should abandon your claim for protection and go back to Iran voluntarily. Now, at first he thought they were joking, but when they persuaded him that it was true, he had a complete nervous breakdown and remained in solitary for the next eight weeks until even the government's psychiatrist was telling the department, this is destroying this man. But they refused to let him out. So we went to court and, and the, um, the department's argument uh, at trial was that you, the trial judge, you have no power to tell us how to treat people in immigration detention. Pretty disreputable argument. That was their argument though. Um, <clears throat> the judge disagreed, they lost. They then appealed. And I remember on the appeal, uh, the, one of the judges asked counsel for the government, why are you doing this? What are you trying to do to the man? What is it you want to do to him that requires you know, us to overturn the order, which simply had him removed from solitary and put into a different detention centre so he wouldn't have to confront the people who treated him that way. So there we are. Now, during the Tampa case, um, the Tampa case which <clears throat> really made all of this sort of thing politically advantageous to the government, um, during the Tampa case, the government came up with the Pacific Solution. The Pacific Solution involved us bribing Papua New Guinea and Nauru to warehouse refugees for us. Uh, it was a very crude arrangement um, and it led to some pretty horrible consequences. One of them um, was a young man called Mohammed Sawa, who from his photograph looks as though he was maybe 16 or 17, but we understand he was about 21. Mohammed Sawa was one of the people who'd been rescued by the Tampa, uh, rescued on the 26th of August, 2001. And a group of the others who'd been rescued by Tampa were preparing to have um, a sort of commemoration, I was going to say celebration, but that wouldn't be right, but a, a commemoration of the fact that they had been rescued. They were preparing for it and was going to be held on the 26th of August 2002. They'd spent the intervening time uh, locked up on Nauru. Uh, the, they sent us a letter saying that uh, Mohammed Sawa had woken up on the morning of the 26th of August 2002, sat up in bed, cried out and fell back dead. The government refused to hold an inquest into his death. The Nauruan government refused to hold an inquest into his death. The Australian government was not willing to repatriate his body to Afghanistan because although they were sending Hazara refugees back to Afghanistan on the pretext that it was safe for them because the Taliban had been removed from power, um, they were not willing to send a corpse back because they it, said it was too dangerous to send a corpse back to Afghanistan. Um, the uh, Mohammed Sawa's friends wrote us a letter in which they explained all of this and they said that no one was able to know why he died but that they knew that he had gone to seek the asylum that only God can grant. Um, then there's the case of Aladdin Sisla. By the way, Nauru, so you know, Nauru is a separate independent republic. It's in the Central Pacific. It, um, it's smaller than Tullamarine Airport. It's not a big place. It has a population rather less than 10,000 people. It does not have enough water or food supply for its own people, let alone refugees who are sent there. For some strange reason, Australia thinks it appropriate, poor little crowded Australia, we think it appropriate to bundle our unwanted boat people refugees onto Nauru um, we, if, if we accepted all the boat people who came here, even in the record year, it would have increased our population by less than one tenth of one percent. But those same people sent to Nauru increased the Nauruan population by about 15 percent. Um, for some reason, we think that that's a sensible transaction. One of the people who was sent on the first phase of the Pacific Solution was Aladdin Sisalem. Aladdin Sisalem um, had actually arrived in Australia. He'd arrived in Sabai Island, which is part of Australia in the Torres Strait, and Thursday Island, which is part of Australia in the Torres Strait. Uh, 
In both those places, he had said to Australian officials he wanted to seek protection in Australia. They said, wait with us, come with us. And they took him to Papua New Guinea and put him on Manus Island, uh, which is north of Port Moresby, pretty much on the equator. And that's the other place where we warehouse refugees with the permission of the PNG government. Um, after a while, Aladdin Sisalem uh, asked Australian officials how his asylum claim was going. And they said, oh, you haven't got an asylum claim because you didn't fill out Form 832 or whatever it was. Um, then um, there was a time when all the people held on Manus were hosed out and sent across to Nauru, except Aladdin Sislam, because of course he was in a somewhat different category than the rest. And so he was left there by himself in splendid isolation. And when eventually a group of us learned about this, we went off to court challenging the legality of his detention in Manus Island. And um, it was quite interesting. I'm not often thankful for the tabloid press, but the tabloid press came good on that occasion because we had evidence that it was costing the Australian taxpayers roughly $25,000 per day to keep Aladdin Sisalem in splendid isolation and misery on Manus Island. And the tabloid press in Melbourne and Sydney both had front page articles the next day showing what accommodation you could get in Melbourne or Sydney for $25,000 a day. And it was pretty good, certainly a lot better than Manus Island. Um, the government very quickly came to us and organised a settlement, which was good. Now, I was going to pause briefly um, to tell you something about the, there was an interregnum. I mean, from about sometime in 2007 till sometime in 2009, the whole boat people thing went off the radar. Um, but I can see time's getting on, so I won't tell you the entertaining stories. I was going to tell you about that. In 2009, Tony Abbott, you, you can ask questions about it later if you want. It's not on the exam. Um, in 2009, you may remember, Tony Abbott became leader of the opposition by one vote. And he started hammering the Rudd government for the fact that the um, uh, boats had started arriving and boat people were arriving in Australia. Kevin Rudd then um, launched a ferocious attack on people smugglers, which is very curious because when he was running for office as Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd made much of the fact that his great moral hero was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he must have overlooked momentarily that Dietrich Bonhoeffer had been a people smuggler. He must also have overlooked the fact that, um, that um, um, uh, Oscar Schindler was a people smuggler. And we'd all seen the film, we'd all read the book. Oscar Schindler seemed like a decent guy, a bit hard-edged, but you know, did, did good things. He was a people smuggler. And Gustav Schroeder was a people smuggler. Has anyone here heard of Gustav Schroeder? And, and the voyage of the St. Louis. Okay, the St. Louis was a ship that left Hamburg in May of 1939. Think of the historical significance of that. He was carrying 900 Jewish refugees who were just looking for somewhere else where they could live safely. Um, he, he was a people smuggler, no doubt about it. He was doing it for the money. And he tried every trick in the book to put them ashore in some place safe. He ended up trying to put them ashore in Cuba and had to turn back. He was warded off the coast of Florida at gunpoint and ended up taking them back to the uh, Netherlands, put them ashore in Antwerp, and more than half of his passengers ended up being taken into concentration camps and dying after the Low Countries were invaded by the Nazis. So, um, people smuggler is a, a mixed thing, um, and Rudd obviously forgot that they're not all the scum of the earth, they're not all the vilest people around. He also forgot, I think, that people smuggling is a demand-driven business. You don't set yourself up in business as a people smuggler hoping that people will use you because you are there. Uh, people smugglers come into business because there are people who are desperate enough to risk their lives to avoid a fate which they think is more likely or more terrible than the perils associated with people smuggling. Um, things degenerated pretty badly because Abbott was prepared to play the, the boat people card pretty hard and Rudd played along with it by attacking people smugglers. 
And of course, they were all shedding crocodile tears about the risk that people might drown on their way to Australia. And of course, people do drown in their attempt to escape because not all people smugglers are that careful and sometimes the seas are very dangerous. But um, I guess if, if you don't head this way and drown in the Indian Ocean and head north and drown in the Mediterranean, you're still dead. If you get into the back of a lorry and you're asphyxiated by the exhaust gases, you're still dead, just as dead as if you'd drowned. And the point was captured perfectly by Kathy Wilcox, a cartoonist. You may remember that maybe, what is it, four months ago, a man called Omid Masumali on Nauru committed suicide by dousing himself in petrol and setting himself alight. He and his family had been assessed as refugees. No one could tell them where they would be resettled, if anywhere. Australia has made it plain that people in the current iteration of the Pacific Solution will never be allowed into Australia. Um, the idea of spending the rest of his life on Nauru was so awful that he committed suicide. And Kathy Wilcox did a cartoon, one of the most striking cartoons I've ever seen. It was of a man engulfed in flames and the caption simply read, not drowning. And there you have uh, the point about the drowning excuse. It is simply, I, I frankly don't even think that the politicians believe it. I don't think they're the least bit worried. In fact, some liberal parliamentarians during the Rudd, Gillard Rudd years, some liberal parliamentarians were celebrating every time boats arrived, every time someone drowned, because they realised this was going to be a good arguing point for their side of politics. Um, the, the 2012 saw the reintroduction of the Pacific Solution in much harsher form, was reintroduced I think, by Gillard and then hardened up by Rudd. Um, and the 2013 election, which I hope some of you remember, the 2013 election in Australia was disfigured by the fact that for the first time in our history, both major political parties tried to court political support by trying to outpromise the other in the cruelty with which they would treat boat people. Can you imagine if they had promised cruelty to animals? That would not have worked, but promising cruelty to boat people apparently was a vote winner as they saw it. Since then, we've seen the very harshest aspects of mandatory detention and offshore uh, processing. They call it offshore processing. It's actually false because we've said plainly we will not ever let those people come here. Even though more than 80% of them have been assessed as refugees, we will never let them come into Australia. We're not processing them offshore. We're shoving them away. We're getting rid of them out of Australia, taking them by force against their will to another country. That country has been taught by us how to process asylum claims. And what happens to them after that is a problem for that country. Um, now, since then, um, we've seen uh, episodes like the murder of Reza Barati. Reza Barati was held in Manus Island. There was a disturbance in Manus Island in February 2014. Um, Scott Morrison, who, let it be noted, is probably the most dishonest, hypocritical politician we've ever seen in Australia. Scott Morrison, who was then immigration minister, uh, went on air to say that Reza Barati had escaped from the detention centre and had been killed by locals outside the detention centre. Now, in an, I mean, he was completely wrong, but in a funny way, he'd stumbled across uh, an unhappy truth, which is that the PNG locals hate the refugees and you are not safe if you're anywhere near the PNG locals and your refugee has been forced there. So the idea that they may be resettled there upon being assessed as refugees is not much uh, consolation. It very quickly turned out that Reza Barati had not in fact escaped and had not been killed by locals. Um, what happened was that um, some of us received copies of some eyewitness statements, including one by a man called Benham Sattar. Benham Sattar shared the same room as Reza Barati. 
His eyewitness statement said that he saw Reza Barati running across the compound inside the detention centre, um, trying to get back to his room. He was approached by one of the guards who is named. Uh, the guard had a long piece of timber with two long nails driven through the far end. He swung it twice at Reza Barati, swearing at him and shouting at him. After the second blow, Reza Barati fell to the ground, bleeding profusely from lacerations on the scalp. He was then surrounded by about a dozen guards. These are all people on the Australian payroll surrounded by about a dozen guards who took it in turns to kick him in the head and in the torso until, as the statement goes on to say, one of them, named, picked up a large rock and brought it crashing down on his head. And he said, that killed him. And I know that killed him because the next time one of the other guards kicked him, he didn't flinch. Now, Reza Barati, uh, sorry, um, Benham Satar's statement, along with a another guy, apparently became known to Wilson Security. Wilson Security is the Australian firm that provides security services in Manus and Nauru. And as we discovered from the age not very long ago, they're incorporated in Panama so as to avoid the inconvenience of Australian income tax. Um, you'll notice that their signs are on your local park, Wilson Security. And I could not encourage anyone to do this but I'd be entertained if someone got some stickers made and slapped them across those signs. Stickers simply reading, Wilson Security, Nauru, Manus, Panama. Um, but then I just have an ironic sense of humour. The, the Razor, the, um, razor oh, sorry, not Razor Barati, Benham Satar and the other eyewitness were taken into a cabin by the Wilson Security guys. They were tied to chairs and beaten up. They were then told that if they didn't withdraw their eyewitness statements, they'd be taken outside the camp where they would be publicly raped by locals. That's Wilson Security in action for you. First of all, they help kill a guy and then they threaten with rape the people who've witnessed the murder. Um, all of this is done, as it is said, as a means of deterrence. Um, it is a startling thing that our political leaders, and I use the word in inverted commas, um, have declared that the hard treatment of refugees is uh, desirable because it deters people from taking the risk of using people smugglers. I mean, who would want to take the risk of using a people smuggler to avoid being killed by the Taliban? Who would want to take the risk of drowning in order to avoid the possibility of being slaughtered by your political enemies? Um, that's the supposed deterrent. Now, all of these things um, came, I was gonna mention something about New York. I recently went to New York uh, for the um, <clears throat> UN Summit on Refugees. And I wanna mention one thing in particular, uh, and that is a speech made by President Obama at the Leaders Summit on the second day. President Obama singled out Germany uh, Canada, Austria, Netherlands and Australia for special praise for the way we treat, for the way we handle refugees. And I was astonished when I heard him say it. I thought, who's, who's writing this stuff for him? Is it Malcolm Turnbull or Peter Dutton or Scott Morrison? Um, and it became apparent later when I had some meetings with various people in the UN and elsewhere in New York that in America, when they refer to refugees, they mean specifically people who've already been assessed as refugees outside the country and are brought in. And so the praise which Obama was giving us, I think, uh, uh, is only to be understood as praise for our offshore resettlement program. And there is no doubt our offshore resettlement program is a very fine thing. And on a per capita basis, our offshore resettlement program is about three times more generous than America's offshore resettlement program. On the other hand, our treatment of boat people, who are all, almost all, actual refugees, um, our treatment of them is shocking. I was lucky enough to have a conversation with the person at the UN who had organised the summit and it is clear from conversation with her, she hadn't the faintest idea 
of what Australia does to boat people. She had never heard of it. She knew about our offshore resettlement program, but that was it. She had no idea that we were mistreating people in the way we do. She had no idea that we were um, sending people offshore um, and mistreating them so as to um, deter other people from imposing on our generosity. Uh, there was another odd thing. I, I went over to New York not only for the summit but also to visit um, two places in particular. Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, upstate country house called Val Kill and, um, and uh, the 9-11 Memorial because Eleanor Roosevelt, as some of you will probably remember, Eleanor Roosevelt was the architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At the end of the Second World War, as the world drew breath in horror at what was revealed as the European death camps were opened, um, Eleanor Roosevelt said uh, that we should have a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she put together the group and drove it um, and as the, uh, you really need to read the Universal Declaration. It's a great document. It includes in the preamble that uh, it was a response to events which had outraged the conscience of the world. And that is exactly right. It had outraged the conscience of the world. I was interested in that because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights really marks the start of modern human rights discourse in the 20th century. And I say that with all due respect to Raphael Lemkin and, and Hirsch Lauterpacht, but that's when it became a thing. And in the following 50 years, we saw most of the great international human rights instruments come into existence. And the person who was largely responsible for all that was Eleanor Roosevelt. But there's a curious thing. Um, as I, I had to, for practical reasons, in order to get there, I had to go um, first to Beijing and from Beijing north over Siberia and Canada and down into New York. And I noticed at one point that the plane was flying over Harbin. Now, has anyone in this room heard of Harbin in Manchuria? Nope. Harbin was the home of Unit 731. Unit 731 was the place of some of the worst human rights abuses ever perpetrated in modern history. Um, Unit 731 at Harbin in northern China was a place where scientists and doctors conducted a horrible range of experiments on living civilians who had done nothing worse than live in the area. Civilians were taken in. They were in particular fascinated by the effect of various bacterial poisons. And so they would inject live subjects with various poisons and then cut them open while alive in order to watch the progress of the poison through their bloodstream. The vivisection of unwilling victims is one of the most horrendous things imaginable. And in fact, one of the, one of the doctors uh, was recorded as saying that one patient they'd got, well, not a patient, not a patient, is a subject. One subject they'd got, they called them logs, by the way, one of their subjects wasn't even screaming. He knew his end was up. He was taken to the table and tied down. But when he saw the doctor pick up the scalpel, then he began to scream and he continued to scream uncontrollably as the doctor cut him open. And then he stopped screaming because he had died. Um, and the doctor went on to say, all of this was in a day's work for most of the doctors and scientists, but it made an impression on me because this was my first time. They, they did things like tying civilian subjects to stakes in the ground and testing flamethrowers on them. Uh, they would drop um, anthrax spores over un unsuspecting villages in order to watch how the contagion would spread through a civilian population. So here am I, flying to a place which is going to be concerned about refugees and to visit the home of Eleanor Roosevelt, who began the human rights conversation in the second half of the 20th century. 
and I discovered myself flying over Harbin. And the irony of that was that while the Americans were cobbling together the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the aftermath of the Second World War, another group of Americans was doing a deal with the doctors and scientists of Unit 731 Harbin. They offered them immunity from prosecution in exchange for their research. None of those doctors or scientists have ever been prosecuted for anything at all because of that dirty deal done at the very same time as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being put together by Eleanor Roosevelt and her team. Uh, it is one of the great ironies uh, of all recent existence that any country could reach a deal of that sort with people who'd done such appalling, appalling things. And how disgraceful that the Americans thought that they would benefit by getting the research. Um, they didn't do a similar deal with Dr. Mengler. So that's a little bit distant from refugees, but in conclusion, can I merely make this point? The mistreatment of refugees in Australia has become a political instrument since 2001, the Tampa episode. It's become an effective political instrument because in 2001, John Howard started calling them illegal. And when Scott Morrison became immigration minister in 2013, he renamed the Department of Immigration and Citizenship, the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. So the average punter who gets their news from the Murdoch press thinks that we are being protected from criminals. And if you think about that, it makes sense. And okay, maybe it's a bit harsh, but you can't make omelets without breaking eggs. It looks very different when you understand that arriving in Australia using people smugglers is not an offence. Coming here without a permission, without permission of any sort to ask for protection from persecution is not an offence. To call them illegal is just a great political lie. And it is on that lie that Australia's human rights conduct has been broken and debased for the last 15 years. Thank you very much. All right, I've got a few questions I'm going to ask uh, Julian now. And then, as I said, we're going to open up to questions from you guys. So if you have any questions, particularly relating to the exam on this, now's a great time to ask the expert. Um, Julian, a number of humanitarian organisations, including the United Nations, have condemned the conditions and the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. In your position or your opinion as a lawyer, has Australia reneged on any of its human rights obligations? Yes. Uh, I mean, we have sent Hazaras back to Afghanistan, which I would have thought <clears throat> probably constant constitutes refoulement, which breaches the central obligation under the Refugees Convention. Uh, second, we do treat people differently depending on their mode of arrival, and that breaches the Refugees Convention. And we treat children in ways which are undoubtedly in breach of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I think it was early last year, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, delivered a report in relation to five specific cases of five particular people uh, in relation to whom complaints have been made. And the report said that in the treatment of those people, Australia was in breach of its obligations under the Convention Against Torture. And Tony Abbott, who was still our Prime Minister then, um, responded to it by saying, Australians are sick and tired of being lectured to by the UN. Now, it tells you something very grim about Australia when you recognise that a Prime Minister can get away with flicking off as lightly as that a finding by a UN Special Rapporteur that we have been engaged in torture. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty frightening. It is. And, and by the way, just in case you aren't frightened, and none of you look frightened, mm -hmm. just in case you aren't frightened, don't ever forget a Pastor Niemöller's dictum. You need to remember it. Remember that? He said in, in the 1930s, I think, he said, and I paraphrase, when they came for the communists, I said nothing because I was not a communist. When they came for the trade unionists, I said nothing 
because I'm not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I said nothing because I'm not a Jew. And when they came for me, there was no one to speak for me. Never, ever think that the people who are being mistreated, flagrantly mistreated, will always be limited to that present group. Never regard yourselves as safe from any government that mistreats any group like that. You stated, this is a quote, a handful of terrified, persecuted men, women and children, children fleeing such a regime as a threat to our nat national sovereignty is so bizarre that it defies discussion. But this image of these people fleeing, uh, yet still threatening our national sovereignty, has a lot of traction in the public imagination in Australia. Why have people so readily accepted this proposition? Because politicians on both sides repeat the same lie, so why wouldn't people believe it? I mean, we've, we've got probably the worst batch of politicians imaginable at the moment. If only the opposition could bring itself to oppose on subjects like this, it might help. Um, so, yeah, I guess. The other thing is that sovereignty, it's very easy to understand sovereignty as the right to decide who comes to the country and the circumstance in which they come. Does that ring a bell to anyone? That was, that was, the, that was John Howard's um, uh, electioneering line in 2001 after the Tampa. He said, we will decide who comes to this country and the circumstance in which they come. And that is uh, a nice paraphrase of the idea of sovereignty. Um, but let me tell you, first of all, at a formal level, by entering various international human rights conventions, including the Refugees Convention, we have sacrificed a little bit of our sovereignty. We've said, OK, our sovereignty doesn't extend to pushing people away who've come seeking asylum. Right? So I think it's, our sovereignty is qualified by our own voluntary agreement to enter those conventions. But then going back to the John Howard aphorism, um, I could say I'm entitled to decide who will come to my home and the circumstance in which they come. And if I'm sick of having visitors, I could always say, I don't want visitors until Thursday week. And, and no one could criticise me for saying that. But what if the next morning, a little kid runs up to the front door and says, please help, a man with a big knife is chasing me. I could say, come back on Thursday week, but I wouldn't. Why? Because it's sort of different. What do you do? You take her in, sit her down, check her story. If it's genuine, protect her. If it's false, send her home. That's you know, the, we think of sovereignty as if it's some magic thing. It isn't. It is a right uh, to decide who enters the country, but qualified by the observation that we are all human beings and we, are all, we, we owe to other human beings in distress some obligation to alleviate their distress. And that's the problem in Australia. We seem to have got to a stage where we, we seem to fear the possibility of helping other people just in case it takes some of our own luck away from us. And that's wrong. Mm. You've said that in the public conversation in Australia at the moment, we, we're focusing on this term border protection. And when we do that, we're conflating national security with our refugee policy. And that when we do that, in that confusion, we're, we're losing our moral bearings. Mm. But I wonder, how do you think, um, as the stance taken today towards refugees and asylum seekers differs at all to immigration policies of Australia um, in previous generations. Has Australia ever had a moral outlook towards refugees in the past? Um, and if so, when? Um, yes, during the second half of the 1970s, the Fraser government um, brought in about 100,000 Indo-Chinese boat people um, but we need to qualify that just a little bit. <clears throat> Some Indo-Chinese boat people managed to get here directly. Most of them, however, only managed to get to Malaysia. They were processed in Malaysia, and those found to be refugees were brought to Australia, to New Zealand, to Canada, to America, and so on. Um, so I guess it was a little bit more like our offshore resettlement, but it was a much more generous program then. Um, uh, uh, Fraser actually worked pretty hard to achieve that result because when he initially suggested it to Gough Whitlam, um, he met resistance for two reasons. First, he'd just kicked Gough Whitlam out of office. Second, 
Um, Gough Whitlam thought, perhaps plausibly, that people fleeing a communist regime would not be friendly to Labour, because back then Labour was a party of the left. Um, and, uh, and so he thought that probably people fleeing a communist regime would be friendly to the right, and therefore it not, would not be politically beneficial to Labour to support um, Fraser's plan. And Gough Whitlam, with a recollection of the resettlement of Baltic refugees or refugees from the Baltic states uh, when the Soviet Union invaded the Baltic states, famously said to, Whitler, to Fraser's first proposal uh, that we don't want more Vietnamese fucking bolts coming to Australia. That was his actual words. Um, so you can see it was a kind of visceral reaction based on politics, but he eventually, you know, Fraser, to his credit, instead of making a political point of it, actually persuaded him of the rightness of what he proposed. And uh, I don't think anyone would say that it's a pity that we allowed so many Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees to come to Australia. And it's interesting that South Australia, which has always been, I think, the most enlightened state of the country, South Australia now has a governor who, is a Vietnam, who came here as a Vietnamese boat person, which is terrific. So how then has Australia swung from that attitude in the 70s to the attitude that we have now in 2016? Uh, or starting in 2001. How, how did, what prompted that trajectory? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think, look, I mean, Tampa was specifically political. Um, one of John Howard's favourites in the lower house was Jackie Kelly. Jackie Kelly was the Liberal MP for an inner Sydney Western Suburbs seat. And when Howard was going into the lower house to give his speech about his handling of the Tampa affair, apparently Jackie Kelly came up to him and said, John, I'm very worried because a lot of my supporters are moving across to One Nation. And he waved his speech at her and said, don't worry, this will fix it. It was a specifically political gesture he was waiting for the right moment. Uh, he thought that um, he could draw pe Liberal supporters back from One Nation by taking a strong line on the Tampa. What he did, in fact, was to take the whole Liberal Party into One Nation territory. And of course, because they're attached by a string, the Labor Party also drifted to the right. And the problem with politics in Australia now is that neither of the two major parties um, are very close to the centre, mm. both rather to the right of it. So how would you change Australia's refugee policy? How, could, how would you make it more compassionate but still feasible? Uh, okay, well, first of all, I would close down offshore detention. I think it's an abomination and ludicrously expensive, but it's cruel. I, I had a meeting in my chambers early last year with some health workers who'd worked on Manus and um, and also a senior Labor parliamentarian who I've known for a long time. Um, and among the health workers, one of them was particularly interesting. He's a guy who is not a bleeding heart like me. He's a guy who has spent his professional career working in the prison system in Australia. He decided to do a tour of duty on Manus because the pay was good. And he said a few things that really caught people's attention. First, when he first got to Manus, to the compounds and he saw the compounds, his inner reaction was, this is what the concentration camps must have been like. Second, after a week or so inside, he worked out that the conditions in which they're held and the way they're treated was a hundred times worse than anything he'd seen in any Australian prison, um, including maximum security. So innocent people are treated worse than convicted criminals in maximum security. And third, by the end of his tour of duty, he was convinced that the barely acknowledged point of the whole exercise was to break their spirit so they'd abandon their claims for protection and return to face persecution. That's the deterrent thing. Um, now, after the meeting broke up, the Labor parliamentarian stayed on and he said, and I believe him, that he was shocked because he'd never heard facts like that before. And um, he, he, was, he seemed genuinely shocked. But then without missing a beat, he said, of course, it'd be political suicide for us to take a soft line on boats. And that's, that's where Australian politics is debased. You know, the fact that a Labor parliamentarian 
can be genuinely shocked by what's going on and yet support it because it will win them votes, that is terrible. So what would I do? What would I do? First of all, I'd close down offshore detention. Second of all, I would accept that boats will probably start arriving carrying people who are genuinely desperate and looking for protection. Third, when those people arrived, I would say, OK, I'm not into open borders, so I would detain them initially, uh, but only for one month, capped at one month, and use that for preliminary health and security checks and a preliminary assessment of their refugee status, if you want. And at the end of one month, I'd release them into the community on a visa which had conditions that included they must stay in regular contact with the department, they're allowed to work, they're allowed full access to Medicare and Centrelink benefits, and until their refugee status is finalised, they must live in a specified regional town or city. Now, if you make some assumptions about the numbers arriving and their employment, um, let's pretend that the largest arrival number, does anyone in this room know the largest number of boat people who've ever arrived in this country since 1788? 25,000. What's our annual permanent migration intake? Does anyone know? It's around about 200,000. Okay, so and the, the long-term average arrival rate of boat people is about one or 2,000. Okay, and yet we bring in 150 to 200,000 permanent new migrants every year. So we get madly excited when in 2012 we had 25,000 boat people coming in. Um, how different things would have been if the Aborigines in 1788 had had a turn back the boats policy. Um, in any event, um, to, let's assume that 25,000 becomes the new normal. And let's assume that every single one of them remains on full Centrelink benefits. How much will that cost the economy? $500 million a year, very easy arithmetic. But all that 500 million a year would be spent in the, in the um, economies of regional towns and cities, which would be good for them. And um, uh, what are we spending now? Well, between three and five thousand million dollars a year harming them. So what is it better? To spend five or ten times as much in order to harm them or a lot less in order to do some good for the regional economy, some good for the refugees, and make them more likely to be citizens who will improve, work hard to improve the country that they have turned to for help. That's what I'd do. That'd be one thing. Of course, that, if that's unpalatable politically, then another possibility is to say, okay, the biggest collection of would-be boat people cluster in Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So imitate what happened at the end of the Vietnam War and set up processing arrangements in those countries. Uh, not camps, just processing arrangements. And then say, okay, for anyone who is assessed as a refugee, you'll be swiftly, safely resettled. Um, whatever you do, don't use a people smuggler. Stick around. It'll be three months or four months or it'll be five and a half months or seven and a half months, whatever, and you'll be safely resettled. We'd need to cooperate with America, Canada and other countries um, in order to resettle those people. But there's a problem. First of all, we have not cooperated very well with those countries up till now. We sort of play it depending on how things are going. Um, if the last step of that journey is safe rather than dangerous, the number of tyre kickers will increase. There's no doubt about that. That's just human nature. As I said, so far, the boat people who got to Australia through Indonesia over the last 15 years, 90 plus percent have been assessed as refugees. The, the non-genuine refugees proportion will go up. And that's a problem for Thailand, Malaysia or Indonesia, depending on where they are. Um, if we attract them to come down that way and they don't make the grade, then we'll have to do something to help Malaysia, Indonesia or Thailand deal with that problem. And I'm not sure whether we can be trusted to do that. Mm. <coughs> okay. Anyway, there's a couple of ideas off the top of the head. I'm sure you can all think of much better ways of doing it. Oh, pretty good, good Nothing stuff. could be worse than what we're doing now. <laughs> uh, you've written... As a person's character is judged by their conduct, so is a country's character judged by its conduct. 
Australia is now judged overseas by its behaviour as cruel and selfish. We've got a number of international students here with us today. How do you think Australia's position on asylum seekers is viewed internationally? Well, as I said, I think it, it we're assessed as um, cruel and selfish. The, the UN summit um, rather slowed me down a bit because apparently Obama and the people advising him um, are only looking at one narrow slice of what we do. Uh, that worried me quite a bit. And the people who took me there want to try and organise a meeting with Obama to straighten things up. Or Trump, if he gets in. Uh, <laughs> yes, well, look, if, it was a, if I was a pretty young woman, maybe that would work. But <laughs> uh, although I'm not sure I'd want to sacrifice that much. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, I asked you, how do you think Australia's yeah. policy is viewed overseas? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, can, I can only assess... I, I, I had an intern from London um, in my chambers recently, and he said quite a few English politicians are looking at what we do and saying they want to imitate it. Mm. It turns out on examination that the English politicians who like what we're doing like our point system for migration. Uh, the Brexit people think, you know, having a point system for migration is good rather than everyone just being allowed in because they're part of the EU. Um, th those people apparently are blissfully ignorant of what we're doing to boat people. Um, I would like to think that any civilised country that knew about the way we treat boat people would regard us with contempt. But whether they know the facts is another question. All right, let's end on a positive note. Uh, there has been opposition to refugees in this country, but there's also been a lot of support. Can you tell us about the groups that you're aware of uh, in the community who've argued for a more humane approach to asylum seekers? And do you see these groups as growing in influence? Um, it's a pretty disparate lot. Um, and a couple of times people have tried to set um, umbrella organisations to marshal them, which hasn't worked. Rural Australians for Refugees, in my opinion, is one of the best grassroots organisations. They've done fantastic stuff and they've remained enthusiastic. Um, um, I, you can't generalise about it because it, it covers a very wide spectrum. You know, um, RAR is one group. Um, the Refugees Action Collective is probably about as far to the left as people get. Uh, and I don't think I agree with everything they do, but they've been effective. Um, I don't know. Look, I mean, I've been banging away at this for 15 years and everything I've tried has failed, so <laughs> I don't know what you need to do. We're meant to be finishing on a positive on note. OK, OK. <laughs> Let's keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I might open up to questions from you guys now. We've still got a few minutes left. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on whether the Australian government can be held legally accountable for wrongs committed in offshore detention, given that it's outside the Australian jurisdiction, as opposed to the... Papua New Guinea or Nauru governments being held accountable? Yeah, look, good question. Um, I, I, the fact that it happens offshore doesn't make any difference, in my opinion. Um, in two, October 2002, uh, Australia introduced into its criminal code a number of offences which mirror offences in the Statute of Rome, which underpins the International Criminal Court. We did that because um, the, it's a condition of signing up to the International Criminal Court that you have to have domestic legislation that mirrors its provisions. So it was not until October 2002 that genocide became an offence in Australia. Think about that. Um, and now, the, the um, Criminal Code since October 2002 has had various crimes, including crimes against humanity, which we are committing. Um, and actually that's the main, the main group because there's about 15 different crimes against humanity and we're guilty of breaches, regular breaches of several of those provisions. Uh, unfortunately, a prosecution can only be brought against those provisions with the approval of the Attorney General and George Brandis is probably not the person to nod to that one. Um, there's the International Criminal Court which is under-resourced <laughs> Um, so the short answer to your question, I guess, is we are committing crimes which are recognised internationally 
but the enforcement mechanisms are very weak. And there's a very good book I'd recommend all of you read by Philip Sands, who, although he's an international lawyer, writes extremely well. Um, Philip Sands wrote a book called Lawless World, in which he compares, at an international level, um, enforcement of international human rights conventions, which is very weak, and enforcement of international trade conventions, which is very strong. Um, no prizes for guessing why there's a difference. So would we, are we guilty of crimes of various sorts? Yes. Does it matter that they're committed offshore? No. Will we be called to account for it? Probably no. All right, hands up, any other questions? And just speak nice and close to the microphone. Yes. Um, I personally, I couldn't resist myself to um, thank you so much for your endless effort and um, help, especially for uh, those people who are seeking asylum, because I'm one of them. I came, I'm, I'm also from, uh, I'm ethnically Hazara. Um, I fled Afghanistan due to persecution in war uh, and um, came to Australia in 2012, and I was detained in Christmas Island for five months. And I really thank you so much for your effort and giving us this opportunity to uh, seek safety, get education, and um, give back to the Australian community. Uh, coming back to my question is, uh, how do you think Australia can justify applying to be chair of um, Human Rights Council when it knows that it's not abiding by international law? Thanks. Yeah, I think, I think the question answers itself. <laughs> it's just a massive um, example of... Um, brazen self-promotion. But then, let's be candid. At an international level, um, human rights is laced with hypocrisy, uh, which is a great pity. Uh, and I mean, I think it's, it's very interesting that Kevin Rudd, for example, wanted to be the new, the new, wanted to be the new chair of, uh, or the new secretary of the United Nations. Um, of course, it was an Australian who was chair of the United Nations, or generally secretary general of the United Nations, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was um, accepted by the General Assembly. But I don't think we've had an Australian since then. And I don't think Kevin Rudd's track record would have justified him in being secretary general because you know, he, he brought back the Pacific solution and sharpened it to its present level of cruelty. Um, but would that matter? Would that sort of hypocrisy matter at an international level like the United Nations? Maybe not. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Human Rights Council is a pretty dodgy group. You know, there are countries there that have not got a lot to be proud of. Uh, so that, that's how, hypocrisy. Um, I'm interested in how the issue of asylum seekers has now shifted to um, more of a national security issue. Um, and so it's more perceived in the community as though it's like close the borders rather than um, looking at the treatment of asylum seekers. And do you think that this, um, this shift to um, it being around national security was a push like from the government or do you think it was more of like a response like a response um, from the government due to the community community being worried about you know having yep. more asylum seekers around it's been pushed by the government for sure um, initially initially it was um, called border control but they realized very quickly that that was a fairly shaky ground because um, border control means exercising your national sovereignty to determine who comes across the borders. What people didn't figure out at the time was that every year we get between four and five million people coming across our borders, mostly for very short-term purposes like tourism. Um, and so if, even if you take 2012 as a peak year, um, the fact that 25,000 arrive without going through passport control means that our border control failed in about one half of one percent of cases. Now I've always thought that 99.5% was a pretty good mark. I've never thought of it as a failure. So to call it border control just wasn't going to fly. Um, 
But it then, because it got tied up with Islamophobia and post 9-11 hysteria, calling it border protection somehow seemed to work. And especially when you consider it, the department was renamed Immigration and Border Protection in 2013. Um, so that at that point, for 12 years, we'd had liberal politicians repeatedly calling boat people illegal. Now, if you say that often enough, the public general, and especially when the Murdoch press don't contradict it, and when the Labor Party don't contradict it, um, you end up with the public thinking these people are criminals. And to say we are blocking criminals from coming in, that looks like border protection. So it's, a, it's pretty easy. And then, of course, things like the mass movement of people from Syria across to Europe um, creates a sense of anxiety. And by the way, there is underneath all of this, and I'm sorry for breaking one of those unwritten rules of conversation, underneath all of this, there is the observation made quite a while ago by a senior p politician who said, and I paraphrase, all that's necessary for any parliament or any party to gain and hold power is to persuade the people that they're under attack and persuade them that you are protecting them. It works in all places at all times. Can anyone in the room tell me who said that most famously? It was Hermann Goering at Nuremberg in 1946. And he knew a thing or two about how that works. So, you know, if the, if, 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 the, if the general sense in the community is that we are under attack from, um, from Muslim terrorists and by holding the illegals out, that looks like border protection. It's false because, first of all, um, we know that if, if you're fleeing terrorism, you are probably not a terrorist yourself. If you're fleeing extremism, you're probably not an extremist yourself. And we know that boat people who've arrived in Australia and have been absorbed into the community are underrepresented in crime figures, underrepresented. So you are more likely to be a terrorist if you're born and bred Australian than if you've come here as a boat person. So we're protecting ourselves by hammering the wrong people. Hiya. Um, whilst the Australian press have contributed to the dehumanisation of refugees, um, some academics in Australia, particularly Roland Bleeker, have noted how some refugees who have been presented in an individual manner as being vulnerable are more likely to gain sympathy from wider audiences. How far do you agree with this kind of um, research and also to an extent do you think the media as a whole is contributing to this dehumanisation of refugees in Australia? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I missed the first part of that question. So basically, um, basically, the Australian press have contributed to the dehumanisation of refugees, but some have argued that the press has started to become a lot more um, better with it, and actually by presenting them in an individual manner, so not on boats, but presenting them as individual people in photographs that can gain greater sympathy from wider audiences. How far do you agree with that statement? Well, I agree with the idea of humanising yeah. boat people. Uh, I mean, I, I still believe Australians are basically pretty decent people. Um, it's interesting, uh, Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called Cancer Ward many years ago. And in the early pages of Cancer Ward, he refers to a person who, as he said, loved mankind but didn't like people. And it's a nice irony. And I think Australians are the reverse. We like individuals. We're a bit worried about the undistinguished mass. Um, I think you could meet you could meet Australians who, would, who could be introduced to every Afghan boat person who's ever come here and get on well with all of them, but still say, oh, we don't want Afghan boat people. You know, it's very strange. But I think, and I was saying this before during the break, I think human rights is actually all ultimately about the way individual people are treated. Um, you can build it up into grand theories, of course, but it's ultimately about how individual people are treated. And that's why you need to humanise the people who are being mistreated. Because if you don't humanise them, if you don't humanise them as individuals with whom we can identify, then we will continue to tolerate their mistreatment. Up the back, some questions? Thank you. Um, so are you optimistic that the public and the government's attitudes towards refugees can be changed? And what do you think we can do as students to help the situation? 
I, I, again, I missed the first part of that question. I'm uh, sorry. So, um, are you optimistic that the public and the government's attitudes can be changed? Oh. And and what can we do as students? Um, no. <laughs> Because I, I think Australian politics is so contaminated at the moment. I mean, if we had a workable opposition on this issue, then I'd be a little more optimistic. Here's the problem. About, as I understand it, about 70% of the public get their news primarily from Murdoch sources, either online or in hard copy. And about 70% of the public support what the government is doing. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it's not a perfect match of the two 70% cohorts, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a very substantial overlap. Um, now, the, you know, the, the Fairfax Press and Guardian Australia are perfectly happy to publish my views and the views of people who agree with me. Um, but that is just saying things to the 30% who probably already agree with us and doesn't really help. Um, how, if, if I pitch something to the Murdoch Press, they're not interested. So what do you do? Uh, as I say, as I said before, I've spent 15 years banging away at different ideas and nothing's worked so far. Why would I be optimistic? Except I think eventually, eventually, and it may not even be in my lifetime, eventually the truth will break through and decency will break out, I hope. And if not, well then this country will be the worse in s profound ways. Um, and what can students do? Um, Engage with people who disagree with you, but engage as respectfully as possible. I mean, you can't blame people for uh, anti-boat people views if they have grown up on a diet of anti-boat people uh, discourse. You know, if all they're getting is the uncontradicted statements of the idiots in the Liberal Party, um, uh, people like Dutton and Morrison, um, and if, if they get no contradiction, and they get it from the Murdoch press and intellectual giants like Andrew Bolt, um, sort of stir it up rather than saying it's wrong, well then of course people are going to have a different view. But the fact that they've got a different view from you does not mean that they should be abused or mistreated. On the contrary, just have a conversation with them in which you Try and give them a few facts. So, uh, mind you, I thought, I thought that was the right approach right at the beginning. I had this view that all of this was politics and politics was working and so it wouldn't change until the public at large changed their views. So I thought what I would do is try and persuade every member of the Australian public that things were, should be done differently. Well, not every member, but 50% plus one. And I figured the politics would shift if that happened. And so the story that I was going to tell you partway through my talk, but uh, the time was running against me, was this. I um, <clears throat> you know, found myself speaking out about it and I got a lot of hate mail from people uh, and virulently aggressive, abusive hate mail, mostly by email. And I decided I'd answer all of them because I wanted to persuade everyone and this was a group who plainly didn't agree with me. Um, I couldn't answer the people who wrote in because they tended to forget to give their name and address. But with email, you can always reply. And so, um, you know, they'd sort of write to me screaming and shouting and abusing and I'd write back saying, dear so-and-so, thank you for email. I gather you don't agree with me. Did you realise there's this fact and this fact and this fact? And most of them replied. And every reply was polite. Every reply was polite. They'd gone from screaming to room temperature polite in a single step. And that was interesting. And some of them would say, oh, I didn't realise that. Well, I agree with you now. Others would say, that's all very well, but what about this and that and the other? And I'd write back and say, well, there's actually this and that and something else. And overall, more than half of them ended up saying in substance, thank you for discussing it with me. I agree with you now. It, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to respond politely when you're confronted with that sort of thing but it's much more effective than abusing them. So that's the, there's a funny aftermath to this. I think the issue went off the boil in about late 2007, 2008, and it was in late 2008, I was doing a case over in Perth. I checked my email and I saw some hate mail. The hate mail had stopped. And I won't say I missed it, but I was kind of 
interested to see that there was some new hate mail. But it was a difficult one. Um, it, it read, uh, I memorised it. It said, dear fuckwit. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I figured it was hate mail. <laughs> what makes you think that being a QC means anyone who's interested in your opinions, why don't you fuck off and die? Now, I thought, how do you engage with that intellectually? <laughs> Um, so I wrote back and said, dear so-and-so, thank you for your email. The offer of your sister is interesting. Please send photographs. Oh. <laughs> it was intentionally offensive. <laughs> and I had warm images of this guy's face exploding and his hair falling out. <laughs> and, uh, and I was really surprised when he answered almost straight away and said, fair enough, I suppose I was a bit over the top. So I thought, oh. <laughs> There's a rational mind there after all. So I wrote back saying, that's okay, but I've been talking about this stuff for quite a while, and you just wrote now. Why is that? Did you just stumble across it, or did it all get too much? And he wrote back saying, I should come clean. I'd had a huge night out. <laughs> I, I was arguing with a bloke I couldn't stand. We we're arguing about refugees. I suppose I should have written to him. For some reason, I wrote to you. Actually, I think you're doing quite a good job, so please ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> Best email exchange I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, we're going to have to wrap up. Unfortunately, okay. I'm sorry for those of you that still had questions, but can I ask you please to give a very warm welcome? <laughs> <laughs>